Beautiful, aren't they? Absolutely exquisite. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that one's going to make my head itch. That one's going to give me a stomach ache. That one's going to make my head hurt. That one's going to make, make me want to scratch my bottom. All true. But they are the pinnacle of evolution. I know we all think that we're the pinnacle of evolution. But evolution has selected the parasitic life over the free living life. There are more species of parasites than there are of free living organisms. And that includes everything. I'm not even including viruses and bacteria there, because they're not real parasites. They satisfy all the criteria, but we're not even talking about those. We're talking about animals that are single-celled and range up to tapeworms that can be 11 metres long inside your intestine. There's more different species of those than there are of all the other things. And they've been living with us forever. They've shaped the way we've evolved. Our immune system exists to deal with them, and they've changed our immune system as we've been exposed to them. They influence where we live and how we live. They change our behaviour. And I'm going to make you change the way you think about them today. That's not to say that some of them aren't very, very serious. And these are my four big parasites of humans. They're not everybody's big four. The first two are Plasmodium, which causes the malaria disease, and Schistosoma are on everybody's big four of parasites because they kill people. I've got my big four represented here. And you're going to find out a bit more about this in a moment. This is the malaria. So it's one of the smaller jars here. So this is schistosomes. These are their eggs, representing their eggs. This one's hookworm. And I'll talk about hookworm in a bit more detail soon. And this one's toxoplasma. Size represents how many people are infected. And I'll show you a little bit more in a minute about where they're infected. In fact, we might go to Plasmodium straight away, and Neil's going to help me out here, right, Neil? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide you in half, the audience. This side, you're the tropical world. This side, you're the temperate zone. And now here comes malaria. So just watch what the meal does while I talk it through. This is a parasite of the blood. It's spread by mosquitoes. It invades red blood cells. The red ones there are normal red blood cells. The yellow ones have got a malaria parasite in them. They become all knobbly and they circulate in a funny way, and many of them end up in the brain. You end up with anemia from malaria, and if it gets in your brain, you end up in a coma. It's a deadly disease. Malaria kills a child in the tropics every 30 seconds. So by the time I finish talking, something in the region of 30 children will have died of this parasite. And you'll see from what O'Neill's doing, only people on the side of the room are getting lollies. Maybe one or two stupid tourists over here picked it up. <laughs> Schistosomes are a very similar story. Oh, he's going to have to race now. <laughs> Schistosome is a worm, a parasitic worm, lives in the bloodstream. The adults are pretty harmless, but their eggs, which you're about to get, if you're lucky, still in the tropics, lodge in liver, in your kidneys, maybe in your lungs, maybe in your central nervous system. And they're killers. 200,000 people die every year from schistosoma. And they don't really need to. And just as malaria doesn't need to be a killer. And I'll explain why in a moment for both. 230 million people need treatment for schistosoma. Only 23 million people get it. So it's a question of money. We have good drugs for controlling this parasite. The UN is good at distributing it. We just need more people and more money to distribute it to all the people who need it. And then this problem can be solved. Malaria also can be solved. We know how to prevent malaria. Insect nets work around your beds at night. We have drugs that work. Some not as well as others, but we have an arsenal of them that work. We know that spraying with insecticide works. You just have to think of your hometown, Singapore. That should be covered in malaria, but it's not. So we know how to cure it. We know how to control it. It's a matter of cost. It would cost, the best brains estimate, maybe a billion dollars a year for the next several years to control malaria. Sounds like an awful lot of money, I know. But think about this. We spend $12 billion a year on ice cream. $12 billion a year on perfume and cosmetics. Doesn't seem like such a lot after all. Then we've got these other two, which are more insidious, hookworm and toxoplasma. They don't kill, not so much. They're more insidious because they are very effective parasites. They spread far and wide and in large numbers. 
So I'll talk about hookworm first. Hookworms infect... Oh, but wait, we've got to be fair about this, because you guys are going to be unhappy otherwise. This is now the tropics. There's been monumental climate change despite, despite all the best efforts. <laughs> and now you guys are living in the temperate zone. Hookworms infect 600 million people. They're a bit more widespread than malaria and schistosoma. They do get into the temperate zone. They're perfectly capable of living in the temperate zone. They just prefer the tropics, as do most parasites. And this is why. The tropics are warm and wet. Think about where most parasites live. In your tummy, in your intestine, in your blood, in your brain perhaps. It's warm and wet there. They do have to have a free living stage though where they can get out into the environment so they can spread to another host. And they also like it warm and wet. So they prefer the tropics. And just, we're seeing it again. Most of the hookworms are going to the tropics, even though they're perfectly capable of living in a temperate zone. They suck blood from your intestine, these parasites, and cause anemia. And they also cause malnutrition, and they also cause growth and mental retardation in children. And what that means is that children suffer in schools. They don't learn as well as they could. And this creates an insidious cycle of poverty that those children can never break out of. Let's have a look a bit more closely at how they, this parasite does it. This is a life cycle. Looks a little complicated. It's actually a fairly simple life cycle as parasites go. Let's just jump on for the ride at this point. That soil I showed you before, that warm, wet soil, is full of larvae of um, hookworms. They burrow in through any exposed skin. Could be through your feet if you're running around barefoot. Could be through your hands if you're working in fields. They burrow in and then they migrate. And they go to the lungs. And there they go through a, a molting process where they become a next stage of parasite. And they irritate the lungs, you cough them up, and then swallow them, and they get out, end up in your intestine and grow into adults. And you get boy and girl adults. And boy and girl adult worms are just like boy and girl adults of anything else. They look for each other, and then they reproduce. And in this case, they make eggs. And these eggs go out into the feces, in the feces, and get shed out into the environment and contaminate. The drugs for hookworm are good. They're almost as effective as the ones for schistosomes, but there's a problem with this parasite. Six weeks after you've had the drug, you're infected again. We don't develop immunity. It's an amazing manipulator of the immune system. So six weeks after people have been treated, they get infected again. So we need another solution. And we need to think like a parasite to come up with that solution. We have to stop thinking about ourselves. For the parasite, the fact that it's in a human is incidental. It doesn't really care about that. All it cares about is making those eggs. And all it needs to do to make those eggs is take in enough food. The way hookworms do it is through that mouth. You see there those evil looking teeth. They use that not only to grasp onto the intestine, but to cut it so that it bleeds. And then they suck up the blood. And the female worms use that blood to make their eggs. They have a whole specialised array of enzymes and proteins, and obviously those teeth, that allow them to do that. So what can we do about that? There's a couple of things. The first thing is a relatively simple one, and again comes back to money, and that's giving everybody good sanitation. If we could have good sanitation through the world, this problem wouldn't exist. The other way is to imagine how we can stop them eating blood. And there's some great scientists working on this, and they've discovered that you can stop them eating blood, because blood can be toxic. If they don't have the right enzymes to digest it, then they don't survive, actually, that intake of blood, and they don't make the eggs, and the life cycle gets blocked, and therefore, no more hookworm. So it's possible. It's going to take a lot of research, but it's possible. My final parasite is toxoplasma, by far the biggest jar. Same deal here. You can see it even up there. I've said this animal is truly insidious. It can infect every warm-blooded cell in every warm-blooded animal anywhere in the world. You can see by the pictures that it does it. Even polar bears and dolphins get infected. But it really, this parasite only wants to infect cats and mice. One part of its life cycle occurs in cats, and it produces an egg-like organism that we call an oocyst that gets 
secreted out into the environment. Mice come along, eat food that's contaminated with those oocysts and get infected. In the mice, it's a different parasite. It goes into their muscles, and that makes sense because the completion of the life cycle means that the parasite, that the mouse gets eaten by a cat and the cat picks up the parasite. But it does an amazing thing on the way. It, it takes out an insurance policy. It doesn't just get in the, in the muscle, it gets in the brain of the mouse. And why does it do that? Because it then changes the chemistry of that brain and the mouse becomes unafraid of cats. So instead of running away from cats, it just stays there, even thinks it can take them on. <laughs> All these other animals on this picture are accidents. Toxoplasma is just very adaptable and gets into all of them. There's no need for it to, in fact, but it does. And we're one of those accidents. Humans get infected in a number of ways, and one out of three of every person in the world is infected. And as you will have just seen, three out of four people in the tropics are infected. For most of us, it's never ever going to be a problem. But for some people, it's a very serious problem. And just from the sheer numbers of people infected, that becomes significant. It can cause miscarriage and stillbirth if you get infected while you're pregnant. It can cause blindness. In fact, it's a massive cause of blindness in the tropics. It causes learning difficulties right through life. And then as we get older, this is the really insidious part about toxoplasma, it causes mental disease. If you look at a map of the world and the distribution of schizophrenia, it's more prevalent in the tropics. This is one of the causes. How does it do that? How does it manage to be this successful? It looks very complicated, this life cycle, but this holds the answer to its success. Let's start just in the red bit. The red cycle is the cat and mouse cycle. So let's start at the mouse. We've got an infected mouse. It's gone out one day thinking, I'm going to take on a cat today. <laughs> Inevitable happens, the cat wins. Usually it's a kitten, mind you, they, and, and, and it gets infected. For about two weeks, that kitten is going to be infected, and it's going to be turning the very few parasites that it's picked up from that one mouse into billions of new parasites and shedding them out into the environment as those oocysts. And from there, the life cycle splits up, and that's how we can be infected. Sheep and pigs get infected, and if we eat lamb and pork that's undercooked, we can get infected that way. We can also get infected if our vegetables haven't been washed properly or if we're digging in the garden with bare hands, or if our water's contaminated with these oocysts. So humans can get infected multiple ways. So you have to ask, what can we do about it? How can we stop it? And I'm going back to my theme again. We have to stop thinking like humans. Our inevitable emphasis is always on how it affects us. So it's on this blue circle here. And we can get in, sure, we can reduce the incidence by cooking our meat properly. Sure, if we wash our vegetables properly, we don't get infected. If we garden with gloves on, we're unlikely to get infected. I know what some of you are thinking. We could just get rid of all the cats. <laughs> but no, there's good evidence that cats are actually good for mental health. Plus, they keep mice under control. Plus, they only shed parasites for a couple of weeks. So you've got to think more about it. So think more about it. Look at that life cycle. Break it down. What's important for the parasite? Not worry about what's important for us. What's important for the parasite? And there's only one thing. Those oocysts. Put a cross through that part of the life cycle and the rest of it falls like a deck of cards. And this is true for a number of parasites as well. Even the malaria parasite you can think of this way. It has a very similar life cycle, just that instead of cats it uses mosquitoes. I'll come back to that. So let's look in more depth. This is what the parasite looks like inside a cat. It starts off as this single-celled, very elegant little organism, packed full of protein. Some of the proteins help it hunt down the cell that it wants to invade. Some of them help it invade that cell, and then when it gets inside that cell, it helps them to reproduce. It literally reproduces itself as a clone, like the clone army in Star Wars. Get from one little parasite, goes back, and forward, back and forward, back and forward, just manufacturing soldiers. But then in the cat, something remarkable happens. These simple, single-celled parasites change. They turn off 
one set of genes and they turn on a whole different set. And just like worms, they become boys and girls. The pink cells are boys, the wriggly little greeny blue cells, the pink cells are girls, sorry, the wriggly little greeny blue cells are boys. And they swim off, find the girl, do what they do, and you get this egg-like structure, the oocyst. This is only in a certain way like eggs because the wall around that pa parasite is impenetrable. Impenetrable to disinfectants, impenetrable to chemicals, impervious to changes in humidity, doesn't mind whether it's wet or dry, it will last out in the environment for a very long time. And like I said, one cat can produce billions of them. So what do we do? We know that there's a lot of proteins that are involved in cell invasion and, and so on. And we know that if we knock out one of those proteins, then another one just takes its place. And that explains why toxoplasma can go into so many different organisms. But what we also know is that in the sexual phase, there's only a certain number of ways you can have sex. And evolution's demonstrated that over and over and over. And toxoplasma is no different. So that's where it's vulnerable. We can identify the proteins that are important for sex in toxoplasma and stop them and then the life cycle stops. We can do the same thing for malaria in a mosquito. And so it just fades away, we hope. If we look at that again, how can we stop it here? The repercussions are that this part of the life cycle stops. But what we're thinking about now is why, what would matter to the parasite, and that is if the cat couldn't host that life cycle anymore. So to protect humans, what we possibly need to think about doing is vaccinating cats. In the case of malaria, to protect humans, what we maybe need to think about doing is vaccinating mosquitoes. <laughs> I know you think it's a crazy idea, but people are working on it. <laughs> and I think it could happen. So it's all very nice science, all very nice theory, but I'm, I'm gonna come back a bit like the previous speaker to why we do it, and this is the reason. Every parasite I've talked about affects children more than any other part of the population including toxoplasma, including malaria especially. So the goal of it is, if we vaccinate a cat or vaccinate a mosquito, is to have smiling, happy children who have perfect vision and learn everything they're taught in school. Thank you.